Okay. Okay, uh, welcome and good evening to all of you. I'm Mila Stroganoff, your host and facilitator this evening and the programs director for the Friends of San Pedro Valley Park. We have a great program ahead of us. We have bugs on the program tonight and still more bugs with an emphasis on beetles. So stay with us. Please <coughs> check the Friends website for recorded natural history webinars of which we have a fair number. And the following is our website. It's simply the name friends of San Pedro Valley Park dot org. Friends of San Pedro Valley Park dot org. This lecture will be recorded and it will be posted on the website in a week or two. Please write questions in the Q and A section and various comments in chat. Questions will be taken at the end of the lecture and we will take as many as time permits. So there will be a limiting factor on how many questions we will actually take. Um, our upcoming program will be with anthropologist uh, Mark Hilkema on Tuesday, April 19th at 7 p.m. He's a great favorite and many of you have heard him lecture before. This program is entitled Mammoth in the Artichokes encounter with an ice age landscape in Monterey County and implications for the first Native Americans. I think we're in for a great program there. Um, I also want to mention before I forget, Stephanie Dole will be giving a program for children in San Pedro Valley Park on Saturday, July 2nd. Uh, it will be outdoors. Our visitor center is closed and probably will be then too. Um, I don't know what the time is, but uh, if our president comes through with a definite time, uh, I will be able to relay that to you at the end of the lecture. So um, that's that for announcements. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Dr. Stephanie Duell, with her program on the extraordinary diversity of beetles. Stephanie Dole, who holds a doctorate degree in entomology, specializes in educating people of all ages about the wonderful world of terrestrial arthropods. And with her business, Beetle Lady, she teaches, teaches programs in the Bay Area and beyond, hoping to instill a love of bugs in others. She will present on the astonishing diversity of insects and beetles specifically, as well as her own research into the diversity of tropical bark beetles. She has been teaching since 1997. Her research activities have been published in several scientific journals. She has had extensive field experience collecting and studying insects in the Ecuadorian Amazon, Guyana, Thailand, the Sonoran Desert, Sierra Nevada, and throughout California. Dr. Dole has contributed immeasurably to her field as a scientist, educator, and researcher. So Stephanie, take it away. Wow, immeasurably. Thank you very much for that introduction, Mila. I very much appreciate it. And yeah. I am, shall I, um, let me spotlight myself for everyone. Um, there we go. All right, welcome and thank you so much for having me today. I'm coming to you from my office here in San Mateo, California. So I'm not too far from those of you in Pacifica and this is my home office. And if you've seen any of my Beetle Lady programs, this is where all those bugs that I bring to my programs and a lot of my collection that I also bring to the programs um, resides. So let me uh, screen share and let's get started tonight. All right. So thank you for having me. I want to talk tonight about a subject near and dear to my heart as a beetle specialist, and that is the extraordinary diversity of beetles. Um, briefly, let me tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, so as Mila said, I own a business called Beetle Lady, and I do educational programs for all ages. I used to say uh, preschoolers through adults, but then the libraries were having me do quite a few baby story times. So we would sing good morning to tarantulas and things like that with the babies and toddlers. Um, 
I do these programs um, for all different ages, and, and my hope is to instill this love of wonder and, and wonder towards insects, which isn't very hard for a lot of children. It's usually as we get older that we lose this love of insects. Uh, so these programs are classes at places like libraries. I also use different classes to try to catch a wider group of people than maybe would normally go to a natural history class. So for instance, I have this Bugs of Pokemon class where I use the fact that a lot of the Pokemon characters that kids know and love and memorize are actually based on real biology of real insects and other arthropods. So that can be a really great um, a way to, to introduce them to this. I also get to teach, I'm one of the few entomologists I know who gets to teach a regular class uh, to high school students. So this is through Design Tech High School, which is the charter public school at Oracle. And so this is a really great opportunity to get to teach this group of uh, young people about entomology. And of course, all of my programs involve live bugs, including tonight. I will be bringing out a few different live beetles to show you under my webcam here. So hopefully you'll get a close up look because I believe that really having people interact with these animals is a great way to foster connection and make them notice them and appreciate them in a way that we are otherwise not taught to in our culture. And another wonderful thing about insects, and I get to do this when I come to San Pedro, is to get kids outside. In fact, you maybe recognize this photo as being from San Pedro Valley Park uh, and get them to actually get to see and observe uh, the nature that's around them and the arthropod life that exists right around us. And one of the recent things that I've also added to my repertoire is a pop-up bug museum. So hopefully some of you can come to see this at some point. Uh, it is a pop-up exhibit that I can put up in a location and it was debuted at Curiosity Museum here in San Mateo in November and it's available to rent for all sorts of groups. So maybe hopefully someday we could have it in the, in the meeting hall in San Pedro Valley Park. And I also love expressing my love of insects and their aston my astonishment at their beauty through art. And these are some of the artworks that I've done around insects. All right, so enough about me. Let's talk about this extraordinary diversity of beetles that I came to talk about. And I hope that I've um, managed to make a talk that has enough science and enough general knowledge and a lot of pretty pictures of beetles too to keep your interest tonight. So. Let's start with how diverse insects are, because this is one of the facts about insects that if I had to pick some things that I could have every human being understand and appreciate about insects, one of them would be how incredibly diverse they are. For me, this fills my heart with wonder and it fills my soul and it's such an important part of my life to know and appreciate this. And it almost makes me sad that so many people go through their lives not getting a chance to appreciate this sort of biodiversity. So. All insects have a very particular body plan that you're all familiar with, and this differentiates them from other terrestrial arthropods that I teach about, things like spiders and scorpions, those arachnids, things like myriapods, millipedes, and centipedes, and some of the land, um, the terrestrial crustaceans that we have, like roly-polies and woodlice. Insects have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. I'm sure all of you know this. They have six legs, which differentiates them from a lot of other arthropods. They have two antennae, which are used as very powerful sensory organs. And they have wings sometimes. When they have wings, they have four wings or two pairs of wings. All of our modern insects, if they don't have wings, and tonight I'm gonna to introduce you to a couple beetles who have secondarily lost their wings. Um, so if you have a modern insect and they have no wings, it's actually a secondary loss. So if you look back in their ancestry, there was a winged ancestor, and now these species don't have wings. Or sometimes, in, like in the case of ants, it's only certain life stages um, that are winged or not winged, or certain things like reproductive ants, right, that have the wings, but the workers never do. And they have compound eyes, which are these extraordinary multifaceted eyes that arthropods have evolved. Now, when we're talking about insect diversity, we're talking about one of the largest groups of animals on our planet in terms of number of species. I always like to tell children that basically me and my friends who are entomologists are making a list of every different species of animal, of insect that we find on our planet. And right now the entomologists have over a million species on 
this list. And one of the most important distinctions when we talk about the biodiversity of insects is the difference between the number of described species. These are species that have been given a uh, binomial name, a scientific genus and species name that have been described in the scientific literature and deposited in a natural history collection somewhere. This is how we officially describe and name species. Uh, there's a difference between this over 1 million described species and the actual number of species because for a group like insects and beetles in particular, we are constantly uncovering new species. Um, so as scientists, we can uh, guess things that we don't know using the data that we have and computer algorithms. We have algorithms that we use that essentially work the same as a mark release recapture uh, estimation of an animal population. In order to estimate an animal population, you don't have to actually catch every animal in that population. You do a, uh, you capture some, you mark them with a tag, then you uh, release them, and then how often you encounter those same individuals again gets added to your data and you figure out how many individuals there must be out there um, based on your data. So for depending on the data we put in and the algorithms we use, we get between 5 and 20 million species of insects that are estimated to exist on our planet. So even if we go back and we are very conservative and we only use that 5 million number, that means for every five kinds of insects that are fluttering and scurrying around our planet, we've only cataloged one of them and there are still four species remaining to be discovered by science and that is huge. You can compare this to uh, 10,000 known species of birds and approximately 5,500 known species of mammals worldwide and it shows you what a huge part of our biodiversity insects make up. If we're talking about our beautiful state of California, we have over 100,000 species of insects that have been recorded from our state. Uh, this is our California state insect, which is a butterfly, the dog-faced butterfly. Uh, and you can compare this to about 223 California mammals and 641 birds. Now, all of us who love California natural history appreciate how diverse our state is in terms of the different ecosystems and habitats, and that's one of the reasons why we have such an incredibly high number of insect species in our state, um, even though we're not a tropical climate. Here's another way I love looking at this. This is a diagram that's from um, Gullen and Cranston's Introductory to Entomology textbook, which I've used when I teach undergraduate entomology. These animals are all drawn, all, these organisms, they're not just animals, they're all drawn in proportion um, to the number of species that are in these groups. So you see this enormous housefly um, just absolutely dwarfing this tiny elk, which represents all mammals, including ourselves. And here's another way to look at it. All of these different animals, um, different groups of animals, how many are known. And again, this is just based on that known number of species. I'm going to show you one of the ways that I've found to show this um, to kids and people of all ages by using my camera here. Um, let me, ah, droop, changing my video. Hold on, not screen share. Here we go. All right. You're gonna see this camera on my desk. So for every one species of mammal, like this wolf represents, like us, there are twice as many species of birds on our planet. So for every one mammal species, there are two species of birds. For every one mammal and two bird species, there are two species of reptiles. And those of you who know a little bit about evolution know that birds and reptiles are kind of considered one and the same biologically nowadays. For every one species of mammal, two species of birds, and two species of reptiles, there are six species of fish. So there's six times as many species of fish as there are mammals like us. But this isn't where most of the biodiversity is. The biodiversity is mostly in the arthropods. So for every one species of mammal, two species of reptiles, two species of birds, and six species of fish, there are 20 species of arachnids. These are spiders and scorpions and ticks and vinegaroons and things like that. But that's not even where the bulk of this biodiversity is on our planet. For every one species of mammal, two species of birds, two species of uh, reptiles, six species of fish, and 20 species of arachnids, there are 200 species of insects. And this remarkable number is still only based on that one million known species and not 
on the actual species. So this number is growing in terms of the insect species. Let me show you how it's growing in terms of a few of the other groups as well. So let's go back to where we were. Here we go. Um, so in this slide, I love this diagram. This one is the dark circles are the known number of species. So you can see our 1 million insects in there. And then the lighter cir blue circle is the um, the undiscovered biodiversity, our estimate of how many species are actually out there. And you can even see on the arachnids, we actually think we have a lower percentage coverage of the, of the species. We only have 17% of the species cataloged. Um, and so this is a tremendous, tremendous area of biodiversity research that still remains to be explored. So before we move on to talk about beetles specifically, I wanted to touch on quickly why insects are so diverse, because beetles are going to come up on this tree that you're about to see, and you'll appreciate some of why beetles have a particular position on the tree of insect life. Um, I could do a whole lecture about this, so but uh, for this for the sake of this one, we'll talk about just these things really quickly. One of the reasons that there are so many insects on our planet is their size. When you are a small animal, you can partition the environment much more finely than a larger animal. So for something like an elk or a squirrel, the forest is their habitat, whereas that same forest habitat can contain insects that are specialists on fungus or specialists on pitcher plants or live in the bark of rotting trees or the bark of living trees. And so you'll have all of these finer partitioned environments within that larger ecosystem that is usually the home of larger animals like mammals or lizards or birds. The reproductive strategy of insects is also um, contributes to their success quite a lot. So insects reproduce very rapidly. They have many offspring with low survivorship in general of the offspring, and they're short-lived. So there's a quicker generation turnover. Um, so therefore, you end up with a lot more uh, rapid genetic evolution, quicker spreading of traits and characteristics throughout populations. Another thing is just their evolutionary timing. Insects just happen to be the resulting evolution of the first um, animals that came onto land after land had been colonized by plants. And so you had these crustacean-like ancestors that came up from the water and insects are the off shoot of all of this diversity that got to colonized land. Now, within their evolution, there were a few key points where I'm going to show these to you on kind of a map of a phylogenetic tree of insect biodiversity in a moment. It's when they evolved flight, when they evolved the ability to fold their wings, and when they evolved metamorphosis. So I'll show you those in a moment so you can see why we know those are clearly big um, points of diversification. Uh, you also are probably familiar with how closely tied insects are to flowering plants. When we see flowering plants show up in the fossil record is also when we start to see a lot of the modern insect taxonomic groups. And that's because we have this tightly linked coevolution of flowering plants with many insect groups. And then another, this is a more recent one. Um, this wasn't even taught to me when I was a student, but this, there have been papers that have been published that show that insects overall have a lower uh, back rate of background extinction, meaning that as a whole, they lose species at a slower rate, at less of a rate. So they tend to accumulate species within this group much more than other um, organism, organismal groups do. Here's that tree. So this is a map of phylogeny and an evolutionary tree, a hypothesis, um, so, so to speak, of the evolution of insects. And you can see there's a few dotted lines. There's definitely um, disagreements about some of these, and you'll see different versions of this. But for this purpose, we're looking at some of the coarser um, groups here. So here are some of those key moments. We have the evolution of wings. This is the pteragoda. Um, so these, the first insects that evolved wings were a lot like what we now call the paleoptera. So the same root word as paleontologist. They're the old winged insects. And these are, there are not very many of these. These are some that you will see at San Pedro Valley Park. Uh, the odonata, the dragonflies and damselflies, and the mayflies, which I know I've definitely seen there when I brought my students there. Then we have pretty soon, evolutionarily speaking, after wings show up, 
insects can fold their wings. And now they can do things like, imagine a honeybee being able to go into a beehive if its wings had to remain out constantly like a dragonfly. So this was a really key point in insect evolution and it also corresponds to a change in the muscular flight mechanisms of flight that make them also more efficient flyers. So when this happens, boom! See, you have all of this diversification, all these branches come off of that point, Neoptera, the new winged insects. And so that's a key point where we know, wow, at this branch in the tree, this innovation happens evolutionarily. And now we have this sudden diversification of insects. Show you another one, which is metamorphosis. So this is when insects evolve what we call complete metamorphosis, which is that typical one that you learn in grade school is that butterflies go through, flies also go through this, as well as wasps and ants, beetles go through this, butterflies and moths, of course, go through it. And when we see this metamorphosis evolve, we have this another huge branching of diversification. And this is also where we have the most speciose groups of insects. This is where we start to have orders of insects where we have the magnitude of tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of species within these groups. So we know that this is a big deal. And beetles are here. Beetles are one of these organisms that has wings, they have folding wings. In fact, we'll talk in a moment about how they have really fancy folding wings, which makes them very successful. And they have complete metamorphosis, which allows them to partition the environment further. So think about how a caterpillar eats leaves, but a butterfly sips nectar. This is metamorphosis. We think one of the reasons that it's caused such success is it's another way that insects can partition the environment. Now the different life cycle stages are not necessarily competing with each other and they're able to exploit different niches in the ecosystem. So let's talk about beetles specifically. Uh, beetles are, I used the beetle before so we know they have all those insect characteristics, right? Beetle anatomy can be a little tricky. I wanted to show you. So if you're looking at a beetle from the above, it often seems very clear, oh, well, that's the head, thorax, abdomen, because you can count one, two, three body parts, as is shown on the left there with that blue, purple, and orange beetle. But that's actually ends up misleading you. If you turn a beetle over and you look at the underside, you get a much clearer picture of the distinguishing, um, the, the distinction between those three body sections. The head, um, then the thorax is always on all insects where all of the uh, parts that have to do with mobility are attached. So if the legs are attached and the wings are attached to it, it is part of the thorax. So you can actually see that on this beetle, it's a much broader part of it because in that one on the left, you have the wing cases that are covering up a huge part of the thorax as well. So I uh, just wanted to show you that. Here's a little video that demonstrates exactly um, the characteristics that we as entomologists believe make beetles so successful. This is their, what we call a synapomorphy. It's their defining characteristic that they have that other insects don't have. In beetles, their front wing cases have evolved into a very hard protective covering for their back flying wings. And you can hopefully see in this beetle that it, uh, those wings, when they come out, are much larger. They actually fold up like origami underneath this beetle's um, wing cases. This is, by the way, is a weevil that landed on me, actually landed on a taxi cab that I was taking to the beach on St. Thomas Island in the Caribbean a few weeks ago on vacation with a friend. Um, so I always carry a bug jar so I can catch something and then take photographs of it and let it go. And so I got these great shots of this. So when they have this case, it essentially goes beyond just being able to fold the wings. Now a beetle can protect those flying wings completely. And so this has enabled beetles to do things like bore into wood, bury themselves in dirt, bury carrion like a, like a burying beetle, uh, roll up dung like a dung beetle, and be in all sorts of environments. There's even aquatic beetles. I have an aquarium right behind me which has swimming beetles in it. That can, they have wings, but they can fold them up and tuck them under and then swim through the water like fish. So we think this is the big characteristic is the evolution of these elytra, the hard wing cases that protect the delicate flying wings. 
So I wanted to show you a beetle really quick to give you kind of an idea of um, what this body plan looks like and to show you some of the differences. This is one of the beetles that I actually have the full life cycle right now. Um, this is a North American Harlequin flower beetle. They're native to warmer parts of our country and also down through Mexico. So you, they're more frequently found in Texas and Mexico, um, but they'll also be in coastal Louisiana and Florida. The larvae feed on rotten wood and leaves and the adults feed on uh, fruit and sap. Um, we have similar ones um, in uh, California, especially in Southern California, there's the green fig beetles. Maybe you've seen them. I've seen them a lot in Southern California, like especially around Anaheim. And um, I see them fly at Disneyland a lot when I take my kids there. So let me change to my um, camera. So here's the larval form of this beetle. Um, and these are very poor walkers. As you can see, this doesn't have a very, um, very uh, good developed ability to walk. That's because this is a digging beetle. This beetle is going to be digging through the soil and it's quite good at doing that. And you can actually see they kind of are inefficient eaters. They eat bits of rotten wood and, um, and dried leaves. And you can see that in their digestive tract, this kind of dark matter that's in there. When these uh, beetles larvae get ready to turn into an adult, they build something that we call a brood ball. And this is a packed ball of dirt, and you can actually kind of sense, if you shake it, that there's a pupa inside. I don't want to disturb the pupa, so I'm not going to open it up to show you, but it looks a lot like a chrysalis for a butterfly. And then emerging out of this in a few months to a few weeks, depending on the conditions and the time of year, is a beetle that looks like this. And this is the harlequin flower beetle. Um, and the adults will live a few months and they are very velvety in, uh, in color and you know, show that really beautiful uh, tendency of beetles to have very striking colors and patterns. So I wanted to just quickly show you those. Let me switch my camera back to me. Okay, and let's start again with sharing this presentation. So let's talk about how diverse beetles are because we've talked about how diverse insects are and beetles are a huge percentage of that diversity. So beetles are an order of insects called coleoptera. It means sheath wings. And right now, entomologists like myself who are called coleopterists who study beetles, we have added a, over 450,000 um, beetle species to that list. Now go back and remember that one million insects. So we're talking about nearly half of the insect species that are known being beetles. Um, so if examples of every plant and animal species were placed in a row, every fifth species would be a beetle and half of those would be a weevil, which are type of beetle, the most diverse group of beetles. Let me show you another way to look at that. As a coleopterist, as I'm looking at the species of plants and animals on our planet, this is how I can count them. One, two, three, four, beetle. One, two, three, four, weevil. And weevils are these snout-nosed beetles that have, they have chewing mandibles on the end of their snouts and they're an incredibly diverse group. And you're gonna hear more about them because bark beetles actually are a type of a weevil. So what ecological roles do these species play? Well, pretty much the answer is when you've got over 450,000 species and counting, it's pretty much all of the ecological roles. Um, but I wanted to show you uh, photographs of a few to give you an idea. These are all photos that I've taken at various locations, both in the United States and abroad, of different um, live beetles. So there are scavengers. This is called a trox beetle. They're a very tough kind of a beetle. They come to lights in Arizona. That's the white is the a sheet from a black light trap where we'll look at the beetles and photograph them for the evening. There are a lot of beetles that are herbivores. Uh, this is a, a beetle from a group called Chrysomelidae. Chrysomelids are leaf beetles, and they tend to have these incredibly shiny, beautiful, reflective colors on their exoskeletons because as much as that seems surprising to us, to be these colors can often be incredibly good camouflage in a dark, wet, leaf-filled uh, rainforest. There's a lot of beetles that are flower feeders that'll 
feed on pollen, um, sometimes beneficial to the plant, sometimes a bit as pests. And that of course leads to them being pollinators as well. Beetles tend to be attracted to flowers that are large because beetles are very clumsy landers. They're not graceful landers. Um, so they kind of crash land into things. They also like white flowers a lot. This is a net winged beetle. So this is a kind of a beetle that you may not recognize instantly as a non entomologist as being a beetle. So there's a lot of diversity in form as well within all these species. There's a lot of wood feeding beetles. These can sometimes be pests, but they can also be very um, important parts of decomposition ecosystems. This is a Prionis a longhorn beetle. We have a species out here. This particular one's from Arizona, but we have a species that looks almost identical that you'll find in the Bay Area here, and I imagine many of you have seen them. They are harmless other than the fact that they have really good pinch with those pinchers, but not a sting or anything like that. And they will actually make an audible squeaking noise. I'm going to introduce you to another beetle that does that in a moment. Uh, just as beetles have co-evolved with flowering plants, they've also co-evolved with fungus. Some of my favorite beetles are fungus feeders. And so this is a really interesting ecological role that they play. Of course, dung feeders are another very important part of decomposition um, in our in ecosystems, and these dung beetles from Arizona are demonstrating that. There's a lot of amazing beetle predators. This is a, a large carabid beetle species, but uh, from San Diego area, from Enza Borrego. But uh, we have out here one of the most frequent types of beetles that I encounter are these carabid. Uh, predaceous ground beetles. They'd be incredibly fearsome predators if they were the size of a tiger, um, but they run around and hunt very fast, very active predators that hunt uh, other small arthropods. And then beetles are just beautiful. That's one of the things that attracted me to them to begin with when I first fell in love with them towards the end of high school. This is what some argue is the most beautiful beetle that we have here in North America. It is the Chrysina gloriosa, Gloria scarab beetle. They're a juniper feeder and just absolutely gorgeous green and metallic silver. That's on my son's hand at a black light in Arizona. Uh, so I want to just show you, these are some more different scarabs to show you different forms that scarabs can take. You may be familiar with the 10 line June beetle, which is a very large fuzzy beetle that we get here in California. This is a local chrysomelid that one of my Design Tech High School students brought in from outside near Oracle. Um, and we have lots of different chrysomelids out in the world. And I, I go as far as thinking that beetles can be quite adorable. I find it hard to believe that other people don't find that face cute. Uh, so these leaf beetles often have striking colors and they have very thick pads for their feet to grip onto the slick surfaces of leaves. So that's why you see those kind of heart shaped um, foot pads. Of course, many of the insects that people absolutely adore, I always joke that uh, ladybugs have some of the best PR of any insect. Uh, they are loved by all people, even people who don't love other insects, and they are a valuable predatory beetle. Uh, there's lots of decomposers. These are tenebrionid beetles. They tend to be scavengers and uh, detritivores. Stag beetles are an amazing wood boring beetle group. And then a lot of beetles take these forms that are kind of unexpected, right? You may not realize these are beetles at first glance because they have almost the look of a moth. Um, and these can be some very incredible looking animals. These are related to a, a small beetle that's quite common around here called the cantharid flower beetle. Um, that is one of the most abundant beetles in my own yard in San Mateo. These are a larger tropical species. And then this is that group weevils that I mentioned. They have this amazing forms with lots of often scales on them that are metallic and reflective. They have these great funny uh, noses in the front, the snouts that have mandibles at the end, often covered with funny little hairs or scales. Um, and they show a lot of different behaviors like death feigning. This is a live beetle, I promise, that's doing death feigning and fine. In fact, let me go back to my little camera. I pulled out one of my death feigning beetles to show you here. Where did he go? He is on this side. Here he is. Pull open this jar. So this is a, a blue death feigning desert beetle. You, oh good, he's moving now, so you're gonna believe me that he's alive. And if we disturb them, oh, maybe he's not gonna do it for us. They um, tend to very, oh, he is not in the mood for it tonight. They will pretend that they're dead. They'll freeze like this um, and put their like, oh, he's kind of doing it now, a little bit of freezing there. So this death feigning behavior is very common among uh, a lot of these beetles. Um, and these are 
quite great, sturdy, long-lived beetles. Uh, let me go back. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay. How am I on time? Oh, good. Okay. We're doing okay. Uh, so, yes, I just wanted to show you a few other pictures. This is a uh, another common group of insects that I think a lot of people especially don't realize are beetles are fireflies because we call them fireflies, but they're actually a type of beetle called the Lampyrid, and they can get quite large in the tropics. They can be quite interesting shapes. This is an amazing group of beetles um, called the blister beetles, the Meloid beetles. They are famous for, if you've ever heard of Spanish fly, um, they make a, a, a chemical cantharin that um, is, is, causes blistering on our skin. Um, and they're fair about it. They often have warning colorations. So these sorts of black and red patterns are warning colors in nature to let us know. And if it's not obvious enough, they'll flash it a little bit at you with their wings to let you know that they've got that, that, uh, that defense. So they're a quite interesting beetle from an ecological chemistry standpoint. And speaking of which, there are also, of course, bombardier beetles, which I hope you've heard of, which create this exothermic reaction from mixing chemicals in their abdomen. So lots of amazing, beautiful beetles that come in all sorts of amazing um, colors and shapes. One last one I want to show you before I start to talk to you about uncovering some of this through research um, is this is a harlequin longhorn beetle from Ecuador. They're one of the most amazing, large, or enormous beetles. And the males have these exaggerated front legs. And this is a great example of how we often don't appreciate these sorts of interconnectedness between species, especially between arthropod species. So when you have one of these beetles and they take off to fly, you get a glimpse of a very special relationship they have. I don't know if you guys can see it in that circle there, that little black dot, that is a pseudoscorpion. It's a type of an arachnid that's a, a not a true scorpion, hence being called a pseudoscorpion. Um, and they always have one of these that lives symbiotically with them under their wing cases. We also have beetles in California that are longhorn beetles that have these native pseudoscorpions that they always carry with them. Um, so it's a very interesting ecological relationship. So, so many of these species are tied together. And then, of course, remember, I've just shown you a whole slideshow of photos of adult beetles, which is usually how we study them, how we think about them. But all of these animals have a complicated life cycle that involves a larval stage. So this little grub, it's actually not so little, <laughs> I uncovered this one in, in Ecuador um, in 2019. And this will be a beautiful large scarab beetle when it matures. So it's it's very interesting to think about all of the roles they play throughout their life cycles. So I want to introduce you to a beetle that has an interesting ecology before I talk a little more about some of the research about how we uncover this diversity, and that's the best beetle. This is a tropical best beetle, um, but I want to introduce you to a few really quick um, to show you some of these other interesting complicated relationships that beetles can have. Best beetles um, are from a family called Pasalidae, and Pasalid beetles also have a lot of other names. They're called best beetles, Betsy beetles, patent leather beetles. These guys feed on rotting wood, and they rely on bacterial endosymbionts to do that. Um, and they live in groups because of this, so, and they're considered pre-social, meaning they're not quite social like a termite or an ant or a bee, but they are on an evolutionary path that is intermediate between being a totally independent free living insect species and one that is truly eusocial. So it's interesting to see these sorts of intermediate steps. It may never develop fully into a social species. It may be very fine the way it is now, um, but it's, it's a very interesting seeing kind of how these sorts of relationships evolve. And they make a sound. I'm gonna play the recorded sound because I still haven't quite gotten my computer speaker to, um, to make it. They make a sound through stridulation. It's kind of a squeaking, scratching noise. Um, and they make that sound. I'll show you in a minute how they make it. The larvae actually produce sound too. They have a little um, hind leg. Their th final pair of legs is, is tiny and it, it basically rubs against a rasp. So I want to show you these guys really quick. So they're very interesting wood feeders. I only have adults, and that is because if you want to keep them in captivity, they keep very well in captivity, but they do not like to breed in captivity be, um, because we disturb them. 
um, too much. So you could breed them in captivity, but basically you'd have to have a log that you never went into to look for them. So these are these best beetles, and they make this squeaking sound by rubbing this part of their abdomen. So it works. I'll put them down for a second. See if oh, let's stay there for us. There you go. Um, the way he's making that sound is much like me making a sound by rubbing my thumb on the tines of this comb. It's, it's stridulation. Um, so these guys, the reason they have to live together in a group is they have to share that bacteria. So the adults will, it's a very large, um, an adult of one of these beetles has this bacteria in their gut that enables them to digest the only food that they eat, which is uh, rotting wood. If they don't have this bacteria, if you treat these beetles with antibiotics, they become completely unable to feed. So it's very important, but they're not born with this gut bacteria, and this is part of why they produce the sound and live semi-socially. They have to share it. So they have young, their larvae, and the adults actually collectively, whether they're the parent of the larva or not, will call to the larvae by making that stridulation, that squeak, the larvae will come up to them and they will transfer the bacteria to the larvae that way. And so we think this is how animals like termites um, evolved. Wood feeding is often cited uh, by evolutionary entomologists as one of the precursors to developing sociality because you have to share, in the case of these beetles, it is a bacteria. In the case of termites, it is a uh, protozoan uh, symbiont. All right, so let's talk about how do we uncover this diversity. This is the final part I want to give you, uh, and hopefully I can get through this really quick. We can stay a little longer for questions. I've tried to keep it short, but I have too much fun. Um, so one of the pluses of being an entomologist is bug hunting is fun. I frequently meet children who do what I get to do as part of my job just for fun on the playground. They go looking for bugs. So I've gotten to, as Mila mentioned, I've gotten to travel to lots of countries. This is me in Thailand with some colleagues there, my colleague Dr. Sawapasantha Chai, and we studied these bark beetles all over the world. And we take the specimens, we take the data, and we hopefully learn a little bit about the um, ecology of these insects and add to our understanding of the biodiversity of beetles. So one of the projects, the most exciting projects that I got to be a part of is looking at the bark beetles um, diversity in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Bark beetles are a type of a weevil. There's actually two main ecological groups in the bark beetles. There are the true bark beetles that feed on the bark of trees and then what we call the ambrosia beetles. And what the ambrosia beetles do is they actually have a fungus that they carry with them and they, um, they use those fungal spores to inoculate the wood that they bore into. The fungus is what actually is able to feed on the tree, and then the beetles feed the fungus. So you can kind of think of them as fungus farmers. In all of the bark beetles in the scolotines, there are 7,500, more than 7,500 described species. And at the point where I started this uh, particular project, there were fewer than 50 species of bark beetles from Ecuador, which was startling because Ecuador contains a huge amount of the Amazon rainforest and a lot of diverse habitats, including places like the cloud forest. So it's very doubtful that there are that few number of bark beetle species. I got to pair with a researcher from the Smithsonian Institute who'd been doing a, a study of the canopy of the rainforest because as entomologists, we're, you know, usually under six foot three, six foot four. I'm certainly a lot under that. And we collect on the ground. So we have to have these creative ways to see how insects are partitioning the environment as far as uh, the upper architecture of the rainforest. And so the question was, what bark beetle species are inhabiting this part of the rainforest that we might be missing with our ground surveys? The professor that I got to work with is Dr. Terry Irwin of the Smithsonian Institute, and he had been doing this research since I had been in high school. So he started this research in the 90s, in the 1990s, and he used a, this is an insecticidal fogger that is used in agriculture, 
and he uses a fast-acting pyrethroid insecticide. And this, these pyrethroids, they actually, um, you may be thinking, oh my gosh, entomologists are using insecticides in the rainforest. They are very fast-acting. They're non-toxic to vertebrates like us. And they also biodegrade into their chemical constituents very rapidly. So they become pretty neutral very rapidly. And so he had been studying particular um, trees for over these, these years. In, in fact, it ended up being decades. We would set up these uh, sheets underneath the trees and then we'd go out very early in the morning and fog the trees and then come back and collect the insects that had fallen onto them. And this is a, a cabinet at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. So I got to not only go through the samples that I collected with Dr. Irwin when I joined him there, but also all the collections that he had done prior to that. And in that, um, I looked at a little, almost 1200 samples and found my bark beetles in 69% of the samples. In the majority of the samples, I got the beetles I was looking for. And there were 2,500 specimens of these beetles in these samples. And we ended up identifying four, over 400 what we call morpho species. And what a morpho species is when you're doing these biodiversity surveys is that describing an actual species takes a lot of time and expertise. So when you're just trying to get a, a cursory idea of the number of species, you look at them physically, what their morphology is like. You don't go as far as doing some of the things that entomologists do in addition, which is sequencing their DNA. You don't look at their genitalia, which is often used to distinguish insect species from each other. So you come up with an estimate. So we had about more than 400 species. And actually, more often than not, morpho species are an underestimate of the actual species because you're not looking at those things that often reveal cryptic species like DNA or a genitalia configuration. So compare that to that 50, right, that we had gotten. This is an extraordinary jump in the diversity. And I hope what this shows is that we're not, it's not that we can't uncover this insect diversity. It's actually quite easy to do so. I mean, as easy as an expedition to the Ecuadorian rainforest is. We actually have tons of these specimens. These, all these samples still exist in the Smithsonian. And most groups of insects, people have not done what I did and looked at them. Um, so th hopefully this can give you an appreciation that if funded and if allowed, we can uncover this diversity as biologists. Um, so we got new, gena uh, new gen genus and lots of new species. In fact, um, at this point, there's been several dissertations and master's degrees done with these species. And I'm actually about to go to Michigan and meet with my former lab mates and talk about doing some work on some of these species that we still haven't described because we certainly have only started to describe them all. And um, happy and sad news is that this was finally formalized into a publication. This was kind of an add on to my dissertation research. Um, so uh, uh, I, cha I published all the other chapters of my dissertation, but not this one. Um, and sadly, the reason that I was uh, spurred to, to publish it was that Dr. Irwin passed of COVID um, during the pandemic. And so there was a memorial issue for him that was published in a scientific journal called Zokies that he had founded. And so this is, uh, we finally got this data out there to start with and, and showing this amazing diversity. Uh, let me quickly, I'll try to wrap things up really quick. So uh, the biodiversity, one of the important things about all of this research is it adds to insect collections. And I, and I want to show you this slide and, and, and remind you that I, although a lot of people like to think of insect collections in places, this is actually the Smithsonian's collection. It's one of the largest collections in the world. These are sources of tremendous amount of data for scientists for years to come. So all of the specimens that I collected um, in Ecuador, they're deposited in collections. They're not, they don't belong to me anymore. They belong to the public good and to science. And in fact, in just the time from when I did my PhD research in the early 2000s to today, um, we went from me having to collect fresh specimens in order to sequence their DNA in order to get good gene sequences out of them. And now we have technology that allows us to sequence small fragmented pieces of DNA. And so all of these specimens now, even if they are even 100 years old or more, can be used um, for DNA analysis. And of course, these are how we get ideas of biogeography of these species, of historical ranges of these species. And then there are technologies that are going to be used on these specimens as data sources 
for years to come, um, by centuries to come, by future scientists. We really can't predict all the ways that they can be used in the future. Um, so it's, it's, it's an amazing way to preserve our knowledge of, of the collection of, uh, of the biodiversity on our planet. And one of the ways I wanted to take this, this next step and show you how what researchers will do with this biodiversity data and how it can be important to us, both from just an understanding biodiversity, just because we're curious human beings, and I personally believe that that's enough of a reason, but also because it can have important economic impacts. So I ended up, one of the reasons that I ended up doing my dissertation on bark and ambrosia beetles was because there was a National Science Foundation grant that allowed, that was um, looking at the uh, diversity of these animals. And one of the reasons that, that it was funded was because these are economically important species that are often invasive. So unfortunately, a lot of insect groups don't have that. Um, to help fund the research for them. So we need to still move the research forward without a, a motivation, uh, economic motivation, hopefully. But what we do with these is then, I use specimens from many collections from all over the world, from any, everywhere from Vienna to Washington DC to Utah. I had all of these and I was trying to ascertain the relationships among a particular group of ambrosia beetles called the xyloborines. And so then these are really interesting ambrosia feeding beetles. They bring along uh, fungal spores in a, in a little chamber in their body called their mycangia. They inoculate the wood and then they feed on this fungus. And their natural history can be really interesting because it, it leads itself often to some very um, interesting invasion scenarios. So they're haplodiploidy, which means that the females have uh, two sets of chromosomes, but the males only have one. This has evolved multiple times in the insects, including, you may know, in honeybees it evolved. Um, so male honeybees have half the number of chromosomes that females do. And they have extremely skewed sex ratios, and they also have extreme inbreeding. So here's how this scenario can work out in terms of being an invasive species. Imagine you have a single unmated, unfertilized female of these beetles that shows up someplace like the port of Oakland. They can then produce a uh, haploid male offspring, and this is where the extreme inbreeding comes in. They will mate with their son to then produce a series of diploid daughter offspring. And here's where it gets, maybe that was just the inbreeding. Here comes the extreme inbreeding. These daughter offspring will then mate with their father brother to produce more diploid females. Now, eventually there is outbreeding in these beetles. They don't just inbreed, but they actually do quite well for quite a long time um, inbreeding. So you could see how this could lead to a very successful invasion scenario. So using specimens that generations of entomologists had collected before me, I was able to reconstruct the evolutionary relationships of this group. This is a tree that was created both looking at the physical characteristics of the beetles, their morphology, looking at them under the microscope with my eyes, um, but also sequencing both nuclear and mitochondrial genes and combining all those uh, data points into computer algorithms that try to reproduce these evolutionary trees. And this is the very starting point. This is why biodiversity research matters. If you have invasive species and you don't even know what they're related to, maybe some of them are even unnamed species, you don't even have a name to put them on, you're behind ground zero when it comes to starting to control them. And I hopefully you appreciate that insect relationships in the ecosystem are so complex that we can't even begin to understand how these all are intertwined. And maybe it's not economically important, but maybe it's something else. Insects produce um, antimicrobials that are far more sophisticated than our antibiotics and our disinfectants. They produce so many interesting things. We just can't have any way of knowing how humanity can benefit. And I also personally, and I imagine that a lot of you in a naturalist group agree, that there is an importance in knowledge for knowledge's sake and for continuing to strive to understand our planet. And if beetles are such a big part of the diversity, then if we're wanting to understand life on our planet, we need to look at beetles as part of that. Uh, really fast, I just want to say before we take uh, questions, how do we conserve beetle diversity? Because hopefully I've got you caring a little bit about beetle diversity and insect diversity in general. Um, so 
one of the first things is changing our attitudes. And I want to tell you a quick tale of two species. I grew up in Los Angeles in the 1980s. And one of the stories that we learned a lot about in school and on the news was the California Condor Recovery Program. The Los Angeles Zoo played a key role in this. They rounded up all the California condors and they did captive breeding of them. And then once they had done that, they started releasing them into the wild. And that's how we have a uh, somewhat healthy California condor population when they were on the verge of extinction before. Now, along with these California condors, they brought in one of their uh, symbiotic species, the California condor louse. This California condor louse is only found, was only found on the California condor. As part of the conservation program at the Los Angeles Zoo, they knowingly deloused all of the California condors that they brought in from the wild and effectively and knowingly causing the species to go extinct. So it, it's kind of remarkable to think that in one of the most touted successful conservation programs that happened within my lifetime, one species was knowingly driven to extinction and not because it harmed the condor. They had a very, you know, balanced relationship. It doesn't uh, make the condor sick or less fit, um, but that was just what they did. They deloused the condor. So it, it brings up interesting questions about how we decide what is valuable and what is worth protecting in our world, right? Now, sometimes we decide that something's valuable. This is the American bearing beetle. It is a, one of the only federally listed beetles. Um, uh, I think basically this and the salt marsh tiger beetle are the only two that I can think of off the top of my head that are actually listed. And there's, it's not because there aren't endangered insects, it's because people don't really care as much, right? So these have been captive bred and there's been a very successful captive breeding and release program that has involved multiple institutions, both universities and zoos across multiple states. Um, but this often gets cited. You hear this about this in the news. Often politicians will bring this up as waste of taxpayer dollars, right? Why are we breeding these bugs that bury dead animals? And what do we care about this? And why are we wasting our time and our money? So the good news of all this is habitat preservation is really key, just as it is with so much of biodiversity. So entomologists, even though we like to complain about the charismatic megafauna, like the tiger getting so much conservation attention, if we just kind of hitch onto that, like a louse on a California condor, but hopefully staying <laughs> with it, um, we can kind of ride that conservation um, momentum and we can be part of it too. Because if you preserve the forest for the tiger, you protect the forest for the beetles. That habitat for the tiger, as I hope you appreciate, is also habitat for hundreds, maybe thousands of beetle species, right? And so that's why habitat preservation is obviously so important. Another fun thing about insects that I want to end on um, is that when it comes to insects, you know, a lot of us can watch these documentaries and think, oh, if I was in charge of that national park or if I was in charge of that pre preserver habitat, this is what I would do. Well, when it comes to insects, any of us who have even a balcony or if you're fortunate enough to be a homeowner and have a little plot of land, you have some choices you can make that actually can impact insect conservation in our area. And so that's that's a very powerful thing that you have that you don't get to have with things like the tiger. Um, so probably preaching to the choir, but planting native California plants. And these are also incredibly drought tolerant, which is we need at this time. We always seem to need that. Um, and these are the plants that our native insects have evolved with. So these are the ones that are gonna have those relationships, not only with the herbivores, but with the carnivores that feed on the herbivores and the parasites that parasitize the caterpillars and all of these different relationships. Um, and planting these can create these wildlife corridors, right? That allow certain species to survive and thrive. Um, you probably already know, but calscape.org is an incredible database of our native plants and their hosts, um, which ones are hosts for particular caterpillars, etc. And so that can be a great way to start. And then another thing I encourage a lot of people to do is to leave the leaves. Um, we have a tendency to think that leaf, all, leaf litter all over the ground in our gardens can be unsightly, but this is often such valuable habitat for our insects. That's where moths are cocooning, beetles are pupating. Um, so even if you rake some of your garden, leaving some of the garden beds with the natural leaf litter and ground cover can be incredibly helpful for your local insects. Um, and so I encourage you to do that. 
All right, hopefully, I, oh, I only went, oh, I went a little over. Uh, I had so much fun, but I'm here to talk to you guys um, and see what questions. Thank you again for having me here. Um, and I, I'm delighted to talk to you and I hope um, I can answer your questions. So let me see. I see one already from Ginger. Um, are you familiar with beetle infestation of the red alders of San Pedro Creek watershed? Can you provide any details about the infestation? Do you know what, oh, that's, that is one I am not familiar with, but let me Google really quick um, what group that's in. I imagine it's a wood boring beetle. Oops, I have to stop my share, hold on. Yeah. Yeah, it's not letting me stop my share, hold on. I've lost my cursor. You know how that happens sometimes on Zoom? There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, let me, do any of you know, anyone want to put in the comments what kind of beetle do you know? Red alder. Let me look that up. This question came up when we had a walk in... Um... In the park, in, yeah. In the park was yeah. Jimmy Blair, and uh, somebody asked about the dieback with the alders, but yeah, yeah I didn't. Let me look back. Um, we didn't. It's often a wood boring beetle, you know, a lot of these things like emerald ash borer, if you've ever heard of those. So it's not just the bark beetles. Um, yeah, I have completely lost my cursor. I'm, I feel like I'm flying blind here on my computer. Yeah, hold on. This is very frustrating. I have completely lost my cursor. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see. So, yeah, if anybody could... I'm having trouble with... My cursor is completely gone. You know, sometimes you're presenting in... Um... Oh, here, I got it back. I got it back. Hold on. It was the keynote that was... Um, let's see. Red Alder... Beetle. Oh, I see red alder beetle. California is a is a search result. Yeah, let's see what these are. Hmm. Okay, so I'm seeing a there's a click beetle, but then oh, the banded alder borer. It looks like that is oh, that is a a cerambicid. That's a longhorn beetle. This might be it. This one is in the Pacific Northwest. Usually with these wood boring beetles. So bark beetles are one of the beetles where the adults bore into the wood. Um, with a lot of the longhorn beetles, it's the larval form. So the adult female will lay the egg into the wood. And what often happens with these beetles is you have things like the emerald ash borer, which was very famous on the East Coast when I was in Michigan, and they were attacking ash trees and they were really afraid that it was going to completely decimate all the ash trees in the area. So they had all these rules about moving firewood. And the reason the emerald ash borer was such a pest was that it was an introduced species. So you often have the, they get introduced um, and then they don't have the natural parasites and predators to keep them in check. And then often they're invading trees that the trees themselves don't have the defenses against those particular beetles. Um, so yeah, I would imagine I can look into it more and find out if that is what is um, happening in San Pedro. But if it's in the Pacific Northwest, it's likely that it's moved down this way. Um, Carol asked about more the symbiotic relationship of the beetles that have uh, the faux scorpion. Yeah, so the scorpions, they end up uh, being kind of, so a lot of these mites and scorpions that live on beetles, and it's actually quite, it's, it's more often than not when you get one of these large beetles and you put it under a microscope, or sometimes you can even see it with the naked eye, they're covered with mites and different things like that. So there's a lot of these arachnids that live on beetles. Um, there's a lot, in fact, I have some hissing cockroaches from Madagascar right next to me, and they have mites all over them. And this isn't just a parasitic relationship because they often feed on um, little bits of detritus on the beetle, whether it's leftover food from the beetle feeding. Um, they also will feed off like uh, bits of 
dry exoskeleton and in fact when you have them that having a symbiotic relationship with a captive insect like the Madagascar hissing cockroach that actually leads to a lower incidence of allergies among the humans who keep these cockroaches because we get allergic sometimes to the uh, essentially it's cockroach dandruff and dust that comes up off the cockroaches bodies and uh, dried droppings and things like that and these mites take care of that so that's where it kind of benefits the the beetle the pseudoscorpion is more of a predator so it's more of a neutral um, effect for those longhorn beetles uh, but they are basically running around eating some of those mites so the beetle you know they want to have these mites but sometimes these infestica infestations get can get a bit out of hand they can be a little less than symbiotic I, I wish I had it on my desktop in an easy way to show you but that same beetle I took a close-up of it and it, it's essentially like all of the seams of its exoskeleton are just packed full of little mites so it's usually that those pseudoscorpions are feeding off of other organisms that live on the beetle. And then they're getting, you know, a pseudoscorpion and all arachnids, they've never evolved wings. And wings are one of the reasons that wings were so important for insect evolution is they're an incredible mechanism of dispersal, especially when you're as small as an insect. You know, think of how far a honeybee can travel or a monarch butterfly, for crying out loud, can do these incredibly long distances. And a, a small organism of that size could never walk that far, right? So the basically the mite or the pseudoscorpion is getting hitching a ride on this beetle. Um, and they can also then, their mating often occurs when the beetles mate themselves. So that's an interesting aspect of it as, as well. Um, yeah, so Carl says, I've heard that insects are becoming a more important item in our diet. Can they comment on the impact, good or bad, from doing this? Yeah, so this is an interesting topic because this has been a topic of discussion. In fact, when I gave you that number of 1997, that very first educational program I ever did was at a film festival where they were showing a film called Microcosmos, which came out, which was an amazing French film about insects. Um, very beautiful film, no narration. You just watch the insects do their thing. It's, it's an amazing film. And um, I did a thing for a film festival that was showing it. I was still an amateur entomologist. I didn't even have my undergraduate yet. And we did a cooking demonstration of insect cooking insects. So this has been a long topic of whether or not this was a sustainable part of our diets. I think one of the shifts that I've seen happen in the last few years is we've gone, a, a couple things have happened. We've gone from seeing only novelty insect eating. So think of this like you go to a gift shop at a museum and they have cricket, little cricket snacks that you can buy and they don't taste very good and you're buying them just to like the novelty of trying them and daring each other to try them or think of like a scorpion and a lollipop, right? To actually thinking about what is good insect cuisine and if we look beyond our own, you know, I say our own culture uh, as Americans, we've got quite a, a, a conglomerate culture of so many cultures, but if we look beyond our Western sense of edible insects and into other parts of the world, they're quite an important part of a lot of different cuisines and they can be quite tasty in the way that they're traditionally prepared. I've also heard good discussions from entomologists and companies that are starting to introduce some of this about whether some of this is appropriating the culture of these people who have long eaten insects and trying to monetize it for the Western world. And that's a whole other debate. The other thing that's really interesting that's happening is I think humans may not, at least in our part of the world ever have insects as a huge part of our diet but one way that it will impact a lot is you're seeing more and more um, if you look up black soldier fly larvae black soldier fly larvae um, facilities are popping up all over the world and they are basically breeding these particular kind of you 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 recognize these from your compost if you if you do composting there are these interesting looking large flies and um, they're very good composting animals and their larvae are now being used a lot for cattle feed. Um, their larvae are also used a lot for feed for poultry and then now um, it's actually recently been authorized you can now buy dog food in the U.S. where black soldier fly larvae are a huge part of the protein in the dog food. In fact they're the primary protein there's no beef for chicken or things like that. So that's another way um, that I think it could impact our diets is in in how where where we insert them in the the whole agricultural chain of things. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the 
overview of that. I hope that wasn't too long winded. North, North American Indians definitely had insects as part of their diet. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I should be cautious saying our part of the world, as you know, what we are is current and then modern when, American culture. Yeah. When Dr. Brian Fisher spoke to us, he mm -hmm. mentioned the fact that they are actually building plants, so to speak, in order to grow insects. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, that the poor people, for instance, in Madagascar can have protein, which they wouldn't otherwise not have. So yeah. the the industry is growing because there is a desperate need for it. Yeah. And that may be the, the turning point, right? Like the, these sorts of changes, especially if they're adopted, you know, the people in Madagascar, they need that protein. They don't have the availability of other protein sources in the same way. Um, and then, you know, I know in Thailand, I worked there a lot and there that's the normal, regular part of diets and people love it. Right. But it's only part of Thailand. There are certain regions where they would turn their nose up at it. So it's an interesting cultural uh, phenomenon as well. And, you know, think about what we consider acceptable arthropods to eat, like shrimp are OK and lobster is OK and crabs OK and crawfish is OK. But, you know, other ones, well, if you if you watch what how shrimp is collected you don't ever want to eat it ever yeah. again right watch yeah. film at the academy and after that i couldn't put a shrimp down into my throat and swallow it yeah. for the life of me so the hope with insects is that um and if you look at the data of the you know the, the nutritional aspects of a lot of these things they are incredibly high in protein and vitamins especially considering the e economic you know availability of them and how how little space is right space is a huge part of agricultural impact how much land it takes to produce a certain amount of protein um so yeah it's it'll be interesting to see I, what i'm i'm pleased that now you're actually seeing more and more things that actually taste good because as an entomologist as far back as the late 1990s i got to sample cuisines where they tasted really good it wasn't just like i'm eating this chocolate covered cricket and smiling for the camera it was this is this tastes good i would order this as a restaurant um so i think that's the thing to look back and not try to reinvent it but yeah well with with the research that goes on for instance you were mentioning the condors and the fact that the scientists saved the condor and destroyed the mites Mm -hmm. um, but back then, the, the idea that existed, I think, with scientists was the fact that it was an individual species that had to be saved. They weren't really concerned with ecosystems. They weren't yeah. concerned with the larger picture. Let's save this particular species at, and to heck with the others. But yeah, that's a very good a point. Much, we have a, a broader perspective on the environment, one where we look at everything that goes with it and hope to save it. Yes. But yeah. There's less and less of it. Yeah. And I think maybe we're more humble, hopefully, in understanding how much we don't know, which is very valuable to appreciate that we can't, we can't. And it's so much harder to fix something, you know, later than to, um, you know, you can't recreate a habitat easily. That doesn't happen. Um, I would encourage all of you to watch. There's an amazing documentary called Sticky. It's a, a, an animated documentary about the Lord Howe stick insect and the conservation around that. And this is an insect that we thought was extinct and found a very tiny population of. And then it was bred at the, I think it was the Queensland Zoo. Um, but anyhow, it's a, it's a really great little short that I, I show my students, especially my high school students, that, that shows, you know, how how these sorts of uh, programs work. Is that S-T-I-C-K-E-E -E or Y at the end? S-T-I-C-K-Y, like sticky, like a stick insect with a Y at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, if you if you like Google sticky film, you'll find it or sticky documentary or, yeah. Um, somebody asked, uh, Michelle asks, is it possible you inoculate the tree with antibiotics to start buck beetles from killing too many trees? Yeah, so, so, this is so a lot of these like you hear about the the pine beetles and and those beetles that are killing these big swaths of trees in uh, places like colorado and in the sierra those are bark true bark beetles so they don't carry the fungus and what's happening with a lot of those you know a bunch of those some of them are invasive species and so they're um they're harming the trees because um, they don't have their natural predators and parasites. There's a lot of parasitism that happens in insects. So um, there's a lot of insects, 
in, in, in a healthy ecosystem, most insects will have at least one species that specializes as a parasite on it that keeps their populations down a little more. And when we have invasive species, they don't bring those over. But sometimes we try to introduce them as humans to try to uh, control a pest. But with the, there's also the problem with a lot of these, the true bark beetles that are a bigger problem in the West or in the United States, they um, are often native beetles but what's happened is our trees are so stressed with droughts, poor foresting practices where we haven't allowed fire to kill trees. And so we have these unhealthy trees or, you know, they haven't allowed the natural turnover that happens with fire ecology. Um, so it's unfortunately, there's a lot of other factors going on when you get into the true bark beetles and they're a lot harder to control in that regard. Um, yeah, and the, and, the, and the fungus beetles, sometimes it's their native fungus, but sometimes they pick up a new fungus that is a pathogen of the trees, and that can get kind of scary too. So whether riparian or not, it, because of the fact that the nature hasn't been allowed its natural yeah. regime of, yeah. of, of being burnt or whatever we have, and then there's the lack of, of, of water, and there is stress that all these trees and, and shrubs are under that are causing, uh, yeah. you know, an, an imbalance. Yeah, because often a healthy tree, you know, that's what sap is for. That sap is to stop these wood boring insects. The tree should be able to just overwhelm them with the sap. But then what happens with some of these bark beetles is they use pheromones to recruit other beetles. And so that's one way that control um, can happen. There are pheromones that have been identified that can attract beetles. So they'll actually make traps to trap the beetles using those pheromones. But some beetles also have um, deterrent pheromones where they'll deter other beetles once they reach a critical mass on a tree. Um, but those are very, this is where we get back to the taxonomy and the collections work and the biodiversity and understanding and documenting these. These pheromones can be different for different species. And if you don't know even the relationships between species, it's hard to know where to start. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it, yeah. And with with your with going into the Amazon mm -hmm. and all the fires and everything that's going on or what we yeah. hear about, and how how do you see the biodiversity of insects being affected? Oh, I mean it's it's heartbreaking. It, it's hard to it, some of it's really hard to comprehend. Like where where I worked with Dr. Irwin was near one of the oil extraction sites and they literally had, you know how oil refineries will have an open flame, right? We see them in the East Bay at the refineries there. Well, when you have one of these open flames at um, in the middle of the rainforest, it draws insects. And so you'd see these piles of dead insects, just mountains of them around um, these flames and things like that. So these, um, you know, there's so many ways that um, that that we impact these habitats and then all the fires that were happening. And it's it's very frightening when the politics of the area start to get to uh, more towards exploiting the natural environment. Right. And so I think, you know, a lot of conservationists have long realized that you really you have to address this is where it's all tied together. You have to address poverty. You have to address you can't tell local people as people like us who have food on our table and shelter and, and security to conserve something when they could plant food for their family there if they slash the rainforest, right? So a huge part of it is incentivizing it, making it so that they see that this contains value for them, right? To Whether that's <clears throat> through ecotourism or natural, more sustainable practices, you have to make it something that's of value. And you see that a lot in Ecuador has done an incredible job with that. They've done a lot of, you know, cons conservation of nature and, and, and these sorts of initiatives are written in literally, my friend who lives in Ecuador has said it's written into our constitution. Um, are they perfect? Not necessarily, but there's a recognition because it's, it has been so valuable to them as a country, right? They've got Galapagos, they've got uh, so much tourism with bird airs and, and other ecotourism. So I think, you know, you have to find ways to make it work um, for the, that's, you, it, it's, poverty is a huge part of why our environment gets degraded, not just the greed of wealthy people, but also the desperation of, of people who don't have what they need. 
Well, let me just check and chat and see if we have anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have I've looked at the Q&A. With check. regards to the, the time of the um, the children's program. Yeah. yeah, so for that, I hope usually with the kids, that when we are at the park, we make an insect pooter, which is a little tool for sucking up bugs that we can make. It's a very inexpensive thing that you can make with salsa cups and straws. And then we go out with nets. I have enough nets for um, 25, 30 kids. I might even have more at this point. I added more to my collection and we can go and actually look and do some catch and release observation of the bugs. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, here's the chat. Okay, you see it on the side? Do you, oh. see, do you see the chat on the side? Oh, me, let's see him. Oh, wait. Oh, there it is. I okay. It. okay. I see now. Laura said, oh, uh, Sonoma County, our bishop pines are infected with different species of bark beetles. Seems they have climatic variable variability plays a role. Um, yeah, so actually most of these beetles, it, it, there are some insects that are you know, specifically take advantage of, um, you know, different disturbances. There's a whole suite of, for instance, this is not a beetle, but there's a whole suite of wasps that show up to forest when forest <laughs> fires have happened um, because they know that now they can easily lay their eggs in those trees. Bark beetles and ambrosia beetles tend to, in their native environments, be much more in balance with things. And so we really only see these huge outbreaks happen in these in when there's been disturbed ecosystems or climate variability and things like that um yeah and the and the fungus the fungus gets really interesting and there's a lab of my former lab mate dr yuri hulser he's at uh university of florida and he has a whole lab where they're doing a lot of work on the fungal symbionts because right those are an evolutionary relationship that's very tightly linked and it's it's really interesting how the fungus and the beetle kind of work together and then we sometimes have um, like these ambrosia beetles for instance have become pests sometimes on things like avocados and they bring um, sometimes they end up with a fungus that's not their native fungus that they would have had in their native range and the fungus can be it's almost like the fungus is ad, it's advantageous for the fungus because they are a fungal pathogen of the plant such as avocado that the beetles are getting into yeah I would like to ask one question which has yeah. been in my mind for a long time mm -hmm. with, re with regards to new finding new species new new gene new genera uh-huh how even after you you you've gone so far as to achieve a and 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 get a phd mm -hmm. you know you do your dissertation and all the rest of it you've done yeah. an enormous amount of research when do you actually begin to realize that you that you found something that has not been described so that you know that was actually some of the first papers my i had i was very um lucky to have a major professor who you know i ended up not staying in academia so this wasn't as advantageous to me but it was good still nonetheless he was very calculated about being sure that his students published as they went and actually some of the first papers i published were new species descriptions and what it takes is basically you have a specimen and you know you have a specimen or, or several specimens hopefully of this of this animal and you look at them, and this is where the collections come into play. You are trying to compare them to all the known species, and you're looking at examples of all those known species. And if you're not seeing a match, then, you know, in, in the past, we used to just rely on looking at the beetles. Sometimes some entomologists could get detailed enough that they'd actually dissect out. Um, insect genitalia is kind of like a lock and key, so the males will have a particular um, shape of their adiagus, which is their male copulatory organ, and those that'll be very species specific, and it will correspond to the female, uh, you know, morphology as well. And so that can sometimes, even if you can't otherwise tell species apart, be a very good clue. Um, now we have DNA to add to it, right? And that's been a tremendous um, source of data for figuring out new species. Although new species are described very frequently still without any DNA coming into play. Um, and then those papers are, it's a very odd skill. It's a, it's a skill that, um, it's a skill set of, you know, how do you actually write, there's an, an international code. So how you actually write it is quite formalized, how you go about 
uh, writing the description and, and cataloging it, and then it has to be published in a journal. And these are usually not, sometimes species are described as part of a larger study. Like when I revised that group of xyloborine beetles, I named some new species. I also moved species that were improperly classified in the genus, and I moved them to the genus that they actually belonged in, and things like that. Um, but a lot of times these papers are very small papers that are in journals that aren't very prestigious. They're like the, for me, for my field, it's the Coleopteris Bulletin, and they're usually like a three or four or five page paper where you're saying, I found these new species and here they are, here's pictures of them, either photographs and or drawings, here's a description, and then you deposit, you have to deposit a specimen that's called the type into yeah. one of the collections, right? So that forever, other, hopefully forever, other entomologists could go. If somebody a hundred years from now looks at the beetles I named and they want to actually see, they can see the actual physical specimen I used. So yeah, and it's, it's an interesting thing. It doesn't take a lot of, I in fact have new species in my cabinet back there and that's what I was going to, you know, that have been sitting there since, you know, 15 years <laughs> almost. And, and it's, it's, it's hard as somebody who now works in the private sector as an educator and doesn't have grants. Um, but here I am, somebody who can actually do it, um, but I would probably have to pay out of pocket for my time and my publication fees, right? Because you have pay as a scientist to publish. Even, even if National Science Foundation has funded your research, you still then have to give some of that money to a, a publisher to publish your research. That's changing a little um, with online publishing, but yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting process naming species and there's all sorts of rules. You can't name a species after yourself but you can name one after somebody else. <laughs> but you have to know the species rather, the, 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 the family or the insects, that particular group so well. Yeah, and that's the rub. Differentiate between what is known and what is not known. Yes, and there are very, there are a lot of groups for which there's no living expert. And in fact, that was the whole uh, mandate of the, particular grant program that I was under. This program doesn't exist anymore, but it was called the PEAT program, and it was Partnerships for Enhancing Expertise in Taxonomy. And one of the ways that groups got these grants was if they could demonstrate that they had a group of insects for which there were living experts who were very senior, who were in their 70s, 80s, maybe even 90s, and nobody coming up the pipeline to kind of absorb their knowledge while there was still a chance and collaborate them while there was still a chance. And bark beetles were one of those groups. I worked with several key people who, um, some of which are still alive, some of which have, have passed. Um, and so the hope was to kind of pass on some of this knowledge because yeah, there's, there's so many insects that you really have to be an expert in that particular group um, in order to describe species. So we tend to be very particular, narrow in our focus when it comes to species descriptions. I wouldn't describe a new species of fly. I wouldn't even describe a new species of most other groups of beetles other than the one I'm familiar with. There's a couple more questions, I think, that have popped up. If, if, oh, yeah, let me see. If you're willing to look. Yeah, let's do a couple more and then and then and I'll then go. call it quits. Then I'll eat dinner. <laughs> yes, um, I think you're probably quite hungry by now. Um, okay, Mark asks, how can I watch the recording? Oh, well, that's that's an answer for you. Um, yeah, oh, actually, so it is an, a, it's a question for you. Um, ah. How can you watch the recording? It's Okay, so basically, basically the recording will be posted uh, by our IT team uh, in a week or two. You go to the website, the friends of San Pedro Valley Park org, and then you go to recordings or lectures or recordings, and then you'll be able to, to actually connect with, with uh, by clicking on that, you connect with the link that's on YouTube, but you can go to the website and you'll be connected. And you'll see a whole slew of various uh, natural history lectures that already are recorded and are available for viewing. I so wonder. They will be, it does go up sometimes, it just depends, they work, and it depends on when they have free time. So it could be in a week's time, but I usually give it two weeks because sometimes they get bogged down and they can't get around to it. Yeah. All right, well, sounds, sounds wonderful. Thank you for recording it. I'm glad that other people can. So it will go up by all means. And thank you for allowing us to record and thank you, Stephanie, so, so much. Yeah, thank for you to all of you. I really appreciate having a group like this invite me to speak. It, it's 
why I do what I do. And if any of you have anything you need insect stuff for in the future, um, I do all ages. I'm always open to new things. I do artist drawing groups. I do all sorts of stuff. Oh, and Judy, did Judy just raise her hand again? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that you're coming to the park at 11 o'clock and we are so excited. 11 o'clock, July 2nd. Okay, I, will, July I just 2nd. had the whole day blocked off for you. So I will right. add it. Wonderful. All right. You can Thank you. Yeah, and, 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 and on my website, hopefully, you know, with the pandemic, I didn't have a lot of public programs listed, but now the libraries are starting to contact me again. So unless, oh, sorry. Oh, my good. Dog, okay. My dog um, so yeah, so hopefully there'll be more programs at libraries and hopefully you know that we were just on the verge of doing more adult programming through the library system right when COVID hit so hopefully I can circle back with them and say hey remember we were talking about planting for pollinators and doing a you know diversity talks and things like that so hopefully we'll have some things oh like that. that'll we'll be so help. great yeah okay. all right well thank, thank you, you so everyone much. I really appreciate it uh, have a good evening be well and uh keep and loving definitely I'll be in touch okay tomorrow. take care Careful. thank you all right. Bye -bye. Thank, you. thank you again. Hey, thank you. Okay. Bye bye. And then, and then I have to. I have the floor.